This man has dedicated his life to a single unique dream. The recreation of the lost combat arts of his ancestral martial heritage. For the last 15 years, he has been exclusively focused on the research, interpretation, and practice of the martial arts of medieval Europe. He is a well-known and prominent figure within the international community of historical European martial artists. Respected as an expert fighter, instructor, and researcher, he has dedicated himself to the resurrection and reconstruction of the ancient and almost forgotten fighting arts of our European forebears. A dreaded competition fighter and much sought after instructor on either side of the Atlantic, at home he runs the Academy of Medieval European Combat, or AMEC, the foremost historical martial arts school in the Netherlands. With six academies around the country, he has a well-earned reputation for producing some of the toughest and most successful historical fighters of the 21st century. Jesus, Mish, can you keep it clean at least for one day? Yeah, that happens if, uh, yeah, if there's just one person uh, cleaning up. Let's see how it looks like. In this series, we will follow the adventures of fight master and entrepreneur Michel Lopez Cardoto as he struggles with the trials and tribulations of a professional medieval fighter. Lopez is one of only a handful of men in the world that makes his living entirely from the sword. For more than 10 years, he has been running a company, teaching at lectures and seminars, and doing other activities such as fight choreography, stunt work, and even acting roles. But the skills Lopez has developed in the field of historical combat are not quite the same as are required for managing a small company. Uh, I started with historical martial arts because of medieval music and uh, a good friend of mine, he died. His uh, wife uh, had a CD, or actually a record still of Hildegard from being a, uh, a nun from the 12th century. She wrote a lot of music, a lot of intriguing, uh, wrote a lot of intriguing books. And uh, I was always searching for something more as a jazz musician and then I stumbled on that uh, record and I heard this, uh, well, Gothic voices almost, Gregorian chant of 12th century uh, music and uh, then this whole world kind of opened up to me. That was very inspiring and at the same time I discovered historical manuals about uh, the historical fencing. Uh, and uh, fighting arts and I was always doing uh, Japanese martial arts and kind of made this switch that I started completely uh, diving into uh, these historical fencing books and uh, starting to discover how the biomechanics was working and how these medieval knights in uh, trial by combat so civil duels were uh, you know standing, uh, standing their ground and how they were doing their thing and the strategies behind it and the philosophy. So uh, everything came together and so you know, so weapon handling while being on a horse, shooting bow or shooting arrow, whatever, how do you call it? Uh, uh -huh. Bow and arrow, shooting bow and arrow. So um, yeah, and playing music. Going to the rehab, so that's where uh, they're gonna fix my knee. Hopefully, well, I have to fix it myself, but they got the training and the exercises. My knee is pretty much screwed at the moment, so I had to go for surgery. And 
it's gonna take still three to four months till I actually can uh, can fight again. So uh, yeah, hopefully everything uh, will be okay in three four months. The life of a professional swordsman is certainly not without danger. During a well rehearsed demo, Lopez managed to critically injure his knee. Dus je moet hard aan de bak, uh, Michel. Heel hard aan de bak. His stated goal, to return European martial arts to their former glory, is at serious risk. If he does not recover from this critical injury, he might not even be able to continue to earn a living as a sword fighter and instructor. The question on his mind now is whether he will ever fully recover. And if he does, how long will that possibly last? Our main goal is, is to reestablish uh, the historical European martial arts. And this is pretty difficult. But uh, because of internet, actually the historical martial arts are now uh, catching on again slowly. For some it might be a surprise that Europe had complex and refined martial arts systems like those typically associated with Asia. And, uh, gunpowder was an extremely uh, powerful tool and uh, it was easier to train uh, people in uh, well, shooting, uh, shooting a gun than to train them in, uh, in fencing. The swords were becoming secondary and becoming smaller and smaller and uh, became like a typical little side arm. And over a period of 250 years, the medieval long sword kind of evolved into this tiny little car antenna where people dance with nowadays in white uh, costumes, which of course is fencing, which is a completely cool, uh, cool sport but it's not historical fencing. Historical European martial arts, or HEMA, are the study and practice of Europe's indigenous man-to-man -man combat systems, which were used with great effect by Europeans for hundreds of years. Some of the European martial arts still exist, having evolved into sports like modern boxing or sport fencing while others, like Italian or German longsword, have sadly died out. Luckily, from the 14th century onwards, many of the masters wrote complex books about these arts and large numbers of these have survived. For over 20 years, researchers have studied these detailed books and used their collective experience to breathe life back into the old arts. Okay guys, so uh, Swash, is, uh, Swash is up. And it's gonna be uh, this weekend. It's gonna be tomorrow morning we're taking off. So I think we're very honored to be there and to be uh, given a demonstration. I, thought, I think it's very cool uh, that Mark uh, wants us there. And. Uh, well, I, uh, I just hope uh, that everything will, uh, will go smooth. You know, it's more or less divided a little bit between uh, really hardcore fighters and a little bit less hardcore fighters. And uh, I don't want you guys to end up with broken fingers or whatever like last time. But I also don't want other people to end up with broken fingers, ribs or broken legs. Geez. So that's very important. I think you guys can have a good chance of pulling it off actually to get to the finals. If it doesn't, if it doesn't happen, it's not a big deal, and at least we try, but I think seriously you guys have a good chance. So, let's make the best out of it. Alright? Think it! Keep it! Let's grab some beers. Officieel nog even. Proost, Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah.
The team are ready for the intense weekend ahead. Lopez and his fight team are at the Royal Armories in Leeds, which, as every year, serves as the magnificent backdrop for SWASH, the Symposium on the Western Art of Swordsmanship Through History. SWASH is the flagship event of the British Federation for Historical Swordplay and is considered one of the most prestigious martial arts events in Europe. The Royal Armouries Collection consists of extensive examples of arms, armor, and artillery of ancient and medieval warfare, and is home to some of the oldest known fencing manuals. But uh, the really important stuff is, of course, first of all, that uh, the medieval longsword or the European longsword has two edges. And uh, if you would compare that to, uh, well, say, an 18th century uh, saber, or uh, let's say a Japanese katana, uh, who only have one edge. Uh, it has biomechanical uh, disadvantages to a uh, two-edged blade. And uh, one of the biomechanical differences, for instance, that you have with a one-edged sword, uh, you have in fact like eight uh, different strikes, diagonal, horizontal, vertically. Well, with a European longsword, there are 26 basic strikes instead of eight. It's not even double because you got two edges, it's actually more because the false edge, the edge that is pointing towards you, you can either invert it or exvert it, which makes it biomechanically completely different while you're in combat. Historical fencing is taught by a variety of experts in the use of a wide range of weapon styles. From the earliest sword and buckler through German and Italian longsword, Spanish and Italian rapier, to French smallsword and military saber. Lopez has been invited to introduce a relatively unknown weapon style, 15th century Dutch dagger. Due to his critical knee injury, he has had to, for once, delegate the actual technique demonstration to two of his top fighters. But can they pull it off? More used to the spotlight than the backstage, his initial concerns vanish rapidly as the simulations are flawlessly executed. The presentation is a huge success. Ik heb een, ja, een tok, maar dat is universeel. Normaal heb ik ook nog een broek voor ijshockey aan, maar die heb ik nu niet. Ik heb voor in de bouw heb ik kniebeschermers. En dan als laatste heb ik voor op mijn schenen heb ik van gewoon veldhockey heb ik scheenbeschermers. Dat is een heel bij elkaar grapzootje, zeg maar. Maar ja, het werkt. Probeer zoveel mogelijk gewoon te doen te pakken, erin en eruit. Dus probeer gewoon op een intelligente manier te benaderen. En als je aan je eigen regels houdt, je eigen kwaliteit en de dingen waar jullie goed in zijn, dan moet het verder geen probleem opleveren. Ja, we gaan het doen.
Though some may argue that tournaments encourage a sports mentality rather than a proper martial attitude and doubt the usefulness of such competitions, the fact remains that tournaments are a vital part of the European martial tradition and the best form of pressure testing available. Most agree that tournament formats that favor skilled fighting and the use of historical technique are critical to the future of historical martial arts. The event has been a great success for Lopez and his team. Being invited is an honor in itself, but the academic recognition and competitive success justly reward their efforts. With the noses in the same direction and realizing that uh, historical swordplay can only survive when we start working together and uh, you know under one banner, and uh, even more maybe so to meet all new faces which I had never met before. So I want to thank you all for uh, the possibility to give a demonstration here, especially, of course, Mark here, who had uh, the balls to invite me over. And uh, I really appreciate that. So thank you very much, everybody.